Thank you so very much. Uh, I want to thank the Japan Society. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming out and uh, for your interest in uh, Ishiro Honda. Uh, I know that my co-author, Ed Gajuchewski, would also like to extend his thanks to you, as well as the Honda family and uh, Yuko Honda Yoon, who also participated participate in the writing of this book. Um, I'd like to start by asking you a fundamental question. Who is Ishiro Honda? I'll give you a clue, he's the one on the right. Uh, Godzilla is, of course, uh, a pop culture phenomenon, uh, a worldwide uh, highly recognized symbol. Uh, but Honda is not so highly recognizable, even though he uh, left us with so many in science fiction and fantasy films that are now pop culture staples, cult films, if you will, but they've lived on uh, for years, for decades after they were originally made, uh, finding new audiences, new generations across international boundaries. This is just a, a smattering of some of the films that he uh, directed in his career. Uh, Destroy All Monsters, The Mysterians, Battle in Outer Space, King Kong versus Godzilla. Uh, I'm going around in circles here, but these are uh, posters and artwork from American and Japanese releases of his film. Uh, the H-Man, this is from a, a, a broadcast on TCM a few years ago. Uh, Gorath, again, clockwise. Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. Atragon, uh, Frankenstein conquers the world. Godzilla versus the Thing, which is a, an epic battle between Godzilla and Mothra. And Rodan, one of my favorites, uh, the flying prehistoric supersonic monster. Now, this is an ad from either Variety or The Hollywood Reporter, I'm not quite sure. Uh, a two-page ad, ballyhooing the release of King Kong versus Godzilla in the United States in 1963. Note how they ballyhoo the big, big, big box office, box office everywhere. And I show you this not just because it's a great kitschy piece of advertising art, but to impress upon you the fact that in his day, which coincided with the, the heyday or the, the golden age of foreign cinema in the United States, Honda was the most commercially successful Japanese filmmaker on an international scale. And I know that it's a, a bit of an apples to oranges uh, comparison, but Kurosawa, who was and arguably still is the first name in Japanese cinema, his films were showing in art house theaters uh, scattered across the country in the major cities, while Hondas were playing in downtown cinemas, suburban drive-ins, big cities, small cities. His films were playing on uh, hundreds of screens across the United States and seen by a far wider audience, but his achievement, this achievement has been obscured by many factors over the years. Now, Honda was uh, overshadowed, of course, by Godzilla, his greatest uh, actor, but uh, he's also overshadowed, I think, uh, I think you'd agree, by Eiji Tsuburaya, a more commonly known name. Eiji Tsuburaya is, of course, the effects artist, the genius who, who gave Godzilla form and who gave all the other uh, monsters in the Kaiju Ega, the, the genre that he and Honda created together uh, form. And Subrai would, of course, uh, go on to become something of a mogul, founding his own studio and launching the Ultraman franchise. But if Subrai, Subrai created, of course, this, this unique Japanese aesthetic of uh, the man in the monster suit trampling through the miniature cities, it's what gives these films their visual style that is so highly recognizable. But if, if Tsuburaya is the magician behind these films, then Honda, I would argue, is the heart and soul. He's the intellect behind these films. So many of these films, starting with the original Godzilla, are imbued with ideas and themes that resonate, uh, that resonated in Japan at the time that they were made and continue to resonate, I would argue. I wanna talk a little bit about what makes Honda tick as a filmmaker, but before that, I'd like to just go back and tell you a little bit about the man because that sort of informs where he's coming from as a director. Honda was born in the mountains. He was born in 1911 in Yamagata Prefecture in a tiny little village called Asahi, which means morning sun, and that kind of uh, testifies to the beauty of the place. This was a, a place rich in, uh, in natural wonders. Uh, it was covered by snow in the winter times. It was uh, covered with dense foliage, beautiful foliage in the summers and springs. And Honda grew up uh, as in a simple environment, simple life. His father was a Buddhist uh, priest at this temple. This is Churenji, but he didn't require that his sons uh, follow in his footsteps. It was a very non-traditional sort of upbringing. And one very important thing is that they were cut off from all the activity going on in, uh, in the, the hustle, hustle and bustle of Meiji-era Tokyo. They were far removed from that. They were up in the, in the mountains 
So Honda had no idea of things that were going on in the big city. He was born in the last year of the Meiji Restoration. These are pictures from uh, his high school days. Uh, I'm sorry, his elementary and high school days. Um, something important happened to Honda in his youth. The, ha the family moved to Tokyo. And so all of a sudden he was introduced to all kinds of things that he had no idea were going on. He didn't even know that trains, or he'd never actually seen a train before he boarded one with his family to move to the city. And he certainly had no idea uh, what a film was until his new uh, elementary school in Tokyo uh, convened uh, an assembly. The students were convened to watch a film. It was an American Western short, uh, silent of course. Uh, and he fell in love with the film. Uh, he fell in love with film, period, both in terms of content and the technology of it. And so later in life, or a few years later certainly, uh, he uh, was getting ready to go on to uh, uh, university studies. He had promised his, his one of his older brothers, Honda was the youngest of four sons, and he had promised his older brother Takamoto, who was a physician, uh, that he would study dentistry and that he would join Takamoto and they would form a, uh, they would hold, have a clinic together. But Honda by now was uh, was fully immersed in his uh, love of film. He had uh, he had an epiphany by uh, one day while watching. Uh, uh, F.W. Murnau's The Last Laugh. Uh, it, it, that was the film in, in, during a conversation with one of his brothers. After watching the film, he suddenly realized that these films actually were made by someone who was called a director, and that the actors weren't just making up the, the film in front of the camera. And so uh, when it came time to, for his studies to commence, he actually um, applied to uh, the Nihon University's new film program. He saw an advertisement for that. He actually secretly applied but when his family found out, his brother wasn't mad and his, his father wasn't upset. They, they actually were, again, sort of a non-traditional upbringing. They just encouraged him to study hard and do his best. But it was something of a risk. Uh, the film industry was still very young uh, in Japan and, and everywhere, really. And it was an untested, un non-traditional, and uh, somewhat risky profession. He knew he was risking his future in doing this. Uh, reminds me of, if you've seen the, uh, the anime feature, Millennium Actress, there's a scene in the in the movie where uh, the young girl is being recruited to act in motion pictures and her mother doesn't want her to do it because she says, uh, paraphrasing, but I believe she says it's an um, uh, un unreputable occupation. So he was taking a great risk, but um, he went on to study film at uh, Nihon University and there he met a number of influential people in his life, one of whom was Iwao Mori, who's shown here in the upper right. Iwao Mori is a very uh, in important figure in the history of Japanese cinema. Uh, he was a uh, film critic, a screenwriter, and at, at this time he had become a film executive. He was uh, an executive at PCL Studios, which was an up-and-coming uh, maker of motion pictures. They had kind of made their name in advertising films, and now they were moving into feature films. And as part of that, Iwao Mori was not only teaching classes in film production and film uh, content, but he started to look for students of great promise and he formed uh, what he called Friday parties which were kind of like coffee clatches where they would get together and talk about film and out of this, these groups he found a few students who he offered essentially uh, an entryway into the studio system. He offered them entry level jobs at PCL and Honda was one of these students. So he entered PCL uh, in the uh, assistant director corps to be an assistant director uh, in the Japanese film industry at that time meant that you were viewed as eventual director of material. And these students, uh, these new trainees learned everything. They learned screenwriting, they learned about editing, they learned about art direction and, and set design and all sorts of things. And then of course they learned how to direct actors. Uh, this, is, this is a vintage photograph of Honda uh, with two of his buddies, uh, one of whom you might recognize quite well. This is Honda on the far right with uh, Akira Kurosawa and uh, Senkichi Taniguchi. These were three up-and-coming directors at the time. So uh, Honda enters the film business, but in 1934 his career was interrupted. He was drafted into the Imperial Army uh, and he would go into active service at the beginning of 1935. Now. Um, the fighting in China was relatively uh, calm at this point. Honda, I'm sorry, J Japan had invaded uh, Manchuria in 1931, uh, but the fighting wouldn't really escalate until a couple of years later. So he thought, well, I'll just serve out my 18 months of military service and I'll return to the studio and I'll get back to work and I'll pursue my career because that's what he really, really wanted to do. But a couple, a couple of things happened. 
uh, not the least of which was the, what is now known as the 226 incident. Uh, on February 26 of 1936, there was an attempted coup against the uh, civilian government of, of Japan by uh, an a group of right-wing extremists within the military, some of whom were associated with the first division, which uh, Honda was part of. Now, uh, the conspirators were rounded up and, and convicted, uh, but Honda and, and other soldiers who were uh, part of the first division were now viewed with suspicion, even though they had nothing to do with this. And so uh, in May of 1936, he was part of a group of soldiers who were sent off to the front in China. And over the roughly 10 year period from 1935 to 45, Honda would be drafted three times. And he always felt, although he couldn't prove it, that uh, this was part of a series of tacit reprisals against he and other people who were only tangentially co connected to this group of people involved in this plot. Now, in the military, Honda experienced a lot of things that would shape his view about war. He went into the, the military as a somewhat reluctant so soldier with no great enthusiasm for the war and for Japan's military ambitions. Things that happened changed his outlook. Uh, he witnessed um, brutal treatment of the soldiers by their commanding officers. He witnessed uh, torture and murder of Korean and, and Chinese civilians by uh, the, the Japanese military. He was forced to work in a comfort station uh, and years later he would write very bravely and very frankly about that experience. Uh, he had a near-death experience. This is a, a mortar that landed in front of Honda during a firefight with Chinese nationalists. And in that moment when the, the bomb landed in front of him, he thought he was going to die as you or I would. Uh, but the bomb didn't explode, and as a matter of fact, after the dust settled, he would return to the scene of the battle and retrieve the shell and take it home with him, and it was on his desk for the rest of his life, <laughs> a memento of his experience. I've held this shell in my hands, and I can tell you that even 70 or so years after the fact, I was terrified that it was about to blow up in my face. And, um, and he was taken prisoner of war at the end of the, the, the year, at the final stages of the war when... Uh, the Jap Japanese military was severely weakened and the Chinese were reclaiming lands that had been seized from them. He was taken prisoner of war in China. And, uh, and his experiences there, uh, actually he, he would report later that they actually, he treated him quite well, but nevertheless. And when he was repatriated to Japan uh, in uh, the spring of 1946, he would pass through the ruins of Hiroshima. Now all of this would have the effect of taking a, a reluctant soldier, someone who didn't have strong feelings, and turning him into somebody who was decidedly anti-war when he returned. Now, when he returned to Japan, Japan was a much different place. Uh, the uh, economy was in shambles. Uh, the city of Tokyo was devastated by the firebombing. And life was uh, very hard. There were food shortages. And the, of course, the country was now occupied by a foreign power that was imposing all kinds of uh, political and social changes. So life was hard and life in the studio was hard. He returned to work at Toho Studios, but it just wasn't the same place anymore. Production had essentially slowed to a crawl, especially after the unions gained so much power. Uh, the democratic reforms prescribed by uh, the allied powers actually encouraged the unionization and the unions were uh, in great power at the studio and this tug of war uh, transpired between the unions and the management and the, the, the anti-communist forces there. So it, it took a long time for him to get his career back on track because there just wasn't as much opportunity to work. So it wasn't until 1951 that Honda got his first opportun opportunity to direct a feature film and that's The Blue Pearl. It stars Ryoi Kebe seen here, one of the great stars of that era. And it's a wonderful little film about uh, life in a coastal town, kind of torn apart between uh, the uh, influx of Western values versus tradi traditional Japanese values. There's a generational conflict between the young poster, the young post-war generation, and the generation before them. Uh, it's a beautiful debut, and it actually got quite good critical reviews. Now, here's a, uh, an interesting side story. Honda wrote the script for this film, which was based on a novel, on a writing retreat at a hot spring with his friend Akira Kurosawa. Uh, Kurosawa, on that writing retreat, wrote the script for what became Rashomon, which is now considered one of the best films ever made. And of course, The Blue Pearl is a film that I hope will be rediscovered someday. Now, uh, Honda goes on in his early years as a director to make a number of different kinds of films. 
Uh, most notably, he uh, helped resuscitate the war film, which was a really popular genre uh, during um, the war. They, but during the war years, they were used as propaganda pieces and they were supported by the government. Uh, now the war film was revived, but these films were more introspective and reflective. He directed Eagle of the Pacific in 1953, which was a huge box office success. Uh, it's the first biopic of Admiral Yamamoto. And then in 1954, he directed a film, uh, which I think is a better film. It's called Farewell Rabal, and it's a drama about Japanese airmen stationed in the South Pacific during the final uh, months of the war, waiting for uh, the inevitable defeat. Now, in 1954 also, a Honda, of course, directed Godzilla. Now, this was a film unlike anything produced in Japan before. It, it really was the brainchild of a producer named Tomoyuki Tanaka, who uh, was somebody who had his, his finger on the pulse of the nation and also was aware of uh, film trends both domestically and around the world. And he knew that King Kong had been re-released uh, internationally in 1952 and made scads of money. And he was also aware of a film made and released in 1953 in the United States about a dinosaur reawakened by an atomic test that swims south and terrorizes New York, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. And so using those as inspirations and other things, he, he concocted the idea for this film. But it was so unusual that some directors didn't want to do it. Honda wasn't the first choice. But because of his background with the war, and also because he had a keen interest in science uh, as a young man, uh, he felt that this was something that he could pull off. But because it was so risky, and they really didn't know how they were going to create this monster and make it believable, before production started, he gathered his crew together and he told them, look, read the script, and if you don't believe in this project, and if you don't think that you can work with me to pull off a, very, a believable, straightforward film, please leave. No hard feelings. But he wanted people to work with him who took this as seriously as he did. Now, a lot of people know by now, uh, it's kind of common knowledge, that Godzilla is a walking... Uh, metaphor for the atomic bomb. That, and that's surely true, but there are a lot of other things going on in Godzilla. It's not just a simple metaphor. This film is really about uh, the collective experiences of Japan and the Japanese people during and after the war. Uh, there are visual reference, references to Hiroshima, the destruction there. Look at the, the, this kind of side-by-side -side comparison between actual news photographs and, and the way uh, Tokyo looks after Godzilla's uh, rampage. Uh, perhaps even more uh, of a visual correlation is between Godzilla and the firebombing of Tokyo uh, in 1944-45. Uh, in particular, there was a, a, a series of raids in early 1945, which uh, I believe are still the most destructive air campaign in, in history. Uh, there were 100,000 structures destroyed. I'm sorry, a million... I believe it's, if, don't quote me, but I believe it's a million structures were destroyed. In, in, in any case, uh, it was quite, quite devastating. And Honda's family lived through this. Uh, his wife, Kimi, and their two children, who were waiting at home for his eventual hopeful return, uh, hid in bomb shelters. Uh, and they could watch the bombs falling from the sky from a bridge in their neighborhood. Another thing that uh, triggered or, or influenced the, uh, the making of Godzilla is the Lucky Dragon incident. This is more uh, uh, close to home. Uh, it actually occurred in, in the beginning of 1954 as T Tanaka was putting this idea together. Uh, the Lucky Dragon incident uh, occurred when um, a Japanese tuna trawler, the Lucky Dragon number 5, uh, strayed a little too close to the Marshall Islands just as the United States was about to test the most a uh, powerful hydrogen bomb in its history. And the fishermen returned home. Many of them got sick. One eventually died. And uh, it created a clamor. There was, this is the birth of the Japanese anti-nuclear movement. Uh, we, here we have a picture of a Geiger counter being used to test fish that was brought back. And as a parallel, a little boy who was uh, too close to Godzilla's path being tested with a Geiger counter. When Godzilla dies at the end of Godzilla, there's really no rejoicing. It's not a happy moment, it's a sad moment, because Godzilla's a victim too. Godzilla didn't choose to come out of the ocean and trample through Tokyo. Godzilla was awakened by the hubris of man, by the, the weapons that were tested by man. So a lot of the themes that are resonating through Godzilla are actually uh, 
uh, characterized or contained in the character of Dr. Serizawa. This is uh, the actor Akihiko Hirata. Dr. Serizawa is a figure uh, that closely parallels, at least on the surface, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer, even though it's a coincidental similarity. This is a, a, a character who carries the burden of having discovered a weapon even more powerful, metaphorically, than the hydrogen bomb. It's the only thing that can kill Godzilla. And so at the end of the film, Godzilla dies, and then Serizawa also puts, uh, takes his own life. And it's his way of not only sacrificing himself, but essentially saving the world. Now this film, one of the interesting things about it, as you look at it, America is never mentioned in the film. Uh, this isn't, Honda wasn't interested in, in, he was not interested in pointing fingers. This is not uh, a film about blaming the United States for Hiroshima or even blaming the United States for the, the hydrogen bomb that in this fictional version of, re, of events awakened Godzilla. Honda saw nuclear prolif proliferation as a global problem. Uh, and the film is really a, a, a cautionary tale, it's a warning. At the end of the film, we have the great actor Takashi Shimura playing Dr. Yamane. In this scene, he, he essentially looks into the camera and says, if we don't stop testing nuclear weapons, another Godzilla will appear. In other words, Honda's saying, if we don't put this genie back in the bottle somehow, mankind has, has given itself through this discovery too much power, the power to destroy ourselves. And if we don't change course, we are going to do that. And looking back on this film more than 60 years later, this is no more true than ever. This film resonates now even more so than it did. It's more true now than ever. We are, uh, the doomsday clock was just uh, you know, inch closer to midnight. And we have a, a, a world where you know, world leaders, including our own president, are talking about the prospect of, or the possibility of nuclear war rather cavalierly. So we go from a, a global issue to a global monster. Godzilla becomes a global monster just two years later when Godzilla, king of the monsters, is released across the United States. Uh, this is the first, albeit in a an highly altered state, the first post-war foreign film to get a major commercial release in America. Uh, but it sets a few precedents. It, it, arguably, we wouldn't be here tonight talking about all this if Godzilla, King of the Monsters had not been released and been such a big success and put Godzilla on the cinematic map. But in order to do that, the, the distributors and the producers who acquired this film uh, hired Raymond Burr. It's kind of a, something of a Hollywood legend now. They hired Raymond Burr, uh, created a character of an American journalist caught in Godzilla's path, and spliced him into the film, arguably somewhat ingeniously by uh, making it appear that he was interacting with Honda's cast. But, you know, the, the, the benefits of this were that the film could be released to a far wider audience than if, if it had been released in its original language and with an all-Japanese cast, uh, 10, 11 years after the war, the possibilities were probably pretty limited. But it sets the precedent because now other distributors uh, have an eye on these films because they're profitable and they take similar steps to alter them to make them uh, more palatable for an American audience, including the dubbing, which is probably the, one of the reasons why these films have been subjected to so much ridicule over the years because the dubbing takes away the original performance of the actors. It takes away any subtle, subtlety in the performance and makes it uh, sometimes unintentionally comical. Well. In the second half of the 1950s, uh, Honda is a very active and very versatile director. He starts working in a, a number of different genres. Uh, he was alternating between essentially science fiction films. He didn't immediately become a monster movie maker. He didn't even direct the first Godzilla sequel. Uh, but he starts making a lot of uh, films about young people navigating the, the difficult world of post-war Tokyo. And, uh, and again, honing in on these generational and cultural conflicts. He had a particular affinity for stories about women. Uh, this is one of my favorite films of his uh, from that time period, Good Luck to These Two, starring Yumi Shirakawa and um, Hiroshi Koizumi, two of his favorite actors. And it's about a couple that falls in love uh, uh, and they have, um, they, they get married against the wishes of their parents. It's a non-traditional, it, the parents want them to, each one, to accept an arranged marriage with a different person. And this is something close to Honda's heart because his marriage also, uh, is, his parents, I'm, I'm sorry, his, his wife's parents did not approve of the marriage and they, they married without the approval of her family. Um, so 
he directs a lot of films, like I, like I said, about women. And at one point, he was even being groomed as a, a director of women's films, much in the vein of Mikio Naruse. But something happened that changed the course of his career. And in a word, Mothra happened. <laughs> Mothra happened. In 1961, Toho looked at the, the kaiju, eja, kaiju ega genre, excuse me, and they decided that they needed to inject uh, something fresh into the formula. And what they did was uh, take the film, the basic uh, story structure is much the same as it ever was, but they injected it, injected it with a family-friendly flavor. And uh, there's mu music in this film, wonderful music, fantasy elements. Uh, the peanuts, the tiny twin fairies, were, are played by a very popular singing... I'm sorry, the, the infant island fairies are pay played by a very popular... Uh, sister act, a singing duo called The Peanuts. Frankie Sakai, a uh, famous comic actor, stars in the film and injects it with a lot of humor. And the film, again, is a huge success. It, uh, this is really the apex of the commercial Japanese film industry, and uh, this film was in the top ten. So again, it sets a precedent. And you, when you are successful, you repeat it. So uh, a year later, King Kong versus Godzilla. King Kong versus Godzilla is the biggest selling film of Honda's career. It's the biggest selling Godzilla film of all time in Japan. But it's a comedy. This is the third Godzilla film, and it's already so far away from the, the, the intent in, uh, of the original film. This has Kong and Godzilla doing wrestling moves. Pro wrestling, pro wrestling was hugely popular uh, in Japan at the time. Uh, and it's a satire on Japanese television, the banality of Japanese television. And then just... A, <laughs> Just 11 years after the original Godzilla, Godzilla is doing a dance on Planet X in this film, Invasion of Astro Monster. So, so what happened? Uh, yeah. Why, uh, well, how, how did Honda feel about these things? Uh, he wasn't comfortable with it. Uh, he was uh, concerned and, uh, and really uh, disheartened that uh, the, the monster that he, brought to the screen as a protest monster, a, a, a protest against nuclear proliferation was being uh, turned into a children's entertainment uh, icon. And the question would be, why didn't he push back? Because especially after a film like King Kong versus Godzilla was made, which was a huge commercial success, especially when given the fact that his films were now pulling in revenue from overseas, why didn't he push back and say, no, I won't do that? Well, the answer is that that really wasn't his personality. Honda was more of a consensus-driven person. He, he actually didn't really have the kind of personality that we here in the West would associate with a film director, a tyrannical you know, person yelling at everybody on set. And as a matter of fact, when you talk to his actors, we interviewed many of them for the book, uh, none of them would say that he ever raised his voice at them. He had a, a cool, calm, and collected manner. Uh, his uh, his way of directing was to, he would get the performance out of his actors by uh, calm, reassuring, you know, uh, he was quietly persuasive, put it that way. But it's not that he didn't like to have fun. Look at him here, he's uh, clattering around in the hand. So he, it just wasn't in his nature. He was a, a company man director, and, he, and frankly, he liked that kind of arrangement. He didn't want to be in charge of everything. He just wanted to make films. And as a matter of fact, Kurosawa, who went independent in the late 50s, encouraged Honda to form his own company, but he wouldn't do it. Uh, and Honda was, by this time, also serving two masters, both Japanese and American producers, because uh, after a time, the American companies started coming to Japan and... Uh, cutting out the middleman by bringing American actors like Russ Tamblin and, and uh, Nick Adams over to star in pictures. So uh, he was having to answer to both the demands of his studio and often to the demands of the Americans who were putting money into these productions. Uh, here's a shot of uh, Honda directing the great Joseph Cotton in uh, Latitude Zero. A lot, a lot of people still don't realize that this film was uh, made and that Honda made it. It's something of a misfire, and part of the problem is that the American backers who were supposed to put up half the funding, uh, they defaulted uh, midway through the production. But it, it's uh, available on DVD, and it's worth, worth seeking out if you haven't seen it. Uh, also at this time, the budgets. Toho was starting to, to slash the budgets of these films quite extensively, and all of this had the effect of you know, making it harder and harder for Honda to make the films the way he liked to make them. Now this film uh, actually is one of my favorites, and I think it's one of his best directed films, 
but it's often uh, derided because it contains so much stock footage. Toho kept the budget low by uh, rehashing and reusing stock film from another of other uh, uh, previous pictures. So uh, in uh, 1970, after he made a film called Space Amoeba, Honda essentially quit. Uh, he would return for one more film in 1975 called Terror of Mechagodzilla. He did some TV work, but essentially he, he started to live the, the retired life. He sold his big house that he had bought uh, at the height of his directorial career and moved into a smaller house with his wife, and he went golfing. And on the golf course, he met up with an old friend that he hadn't seen for a while, and that old friend, of course, was Akira Kurosawa. Now, the, the Kurosawa-Honda friendship runs deep. Uh, it goes back to their days at Toho. This is a vintage photograph of Kurosawa Honda and their friend Senkichi Taniguchi, who also became a pretty good director, uh, with their mentor, Kajiro Yamamoto. Yamamoto was one of the biggest uh, commercial film directors of the 1940s at Toho. As a matter of fact, I talked about those, those big uh, war pictures. He directed uh, some of the biggest ones. And he had a career that lasted well into the 1960s. And he was a lot like Honda in that he enjoyed working in a lot of different genres. He, was, uh, he enjoyed experimenting. Kurosawa, of course, would uh, go off and be, uh, take what he learned from uh, Yamamoto and become Kurosawa. But it was, it was Yamamoto who put uh, Kurosawa in the director's chair. Uh, so Kurosawa and Honda formed a bond. Now, it's, often, it, it's hard to describe what role Honda played on the final five Kurosawa films, uh, beginning with Kagamusha, then Ron, uh, Rhapsody in August, Dreams, and Madadayo. Uh, basically, they worked together from uh, 1980 to 1993, uh, and Honda died just before the release of Madadayo. Uh, it's hard to describe because uh, people would assume that Honda was working as an assistant director, but he was far more than that. But he was, he was and some other people have assumed that he co-directed certain things, which was not true. Uh, Honda was something of a second set of eyes and ears for Kurosawa a lot of the time. Or he could uh, serve as a mediator, uh, a buffer between Kurosawa and, uh, and the crew or uh, other people who he would explode at, Kurosawa having this uh, famously explosive temper. Uh, as far as content is concerned, and there were times when uh, Honda would step in and direct certain scenes when Kurosawa was incapacitated or unavailable, but in terms of content, the film in which Honda appears to have had the, the greatest influence is Akira Kurosawa's Dreams, uh, which is a beautiful film, a series of vignettes based on what else? Akira Kurosawa's Dreams. But there's one, it, there are several ins, uh, uh, of these vignettes that bear um, uh, Honda's imprimatur, but um, none more so than the tunnel sequence. Now, Kurosawa never served in the war. So th this, and this sequence is about, if you haven't seen it, a Japanese soldier returning home after the war. He's walking through the hills of, uh, and, uh, and valleys. And he, is, uh, he encounters on the road the spirit of a dead Japanese soldier, one of the troops that he had commanded. And then suddenly the whole platoon appears. And they're ghosts. They don't know that they're dead. And uh, he has to basically send them back into the, uh, the other world. And um, Honda was haunted ever since he had returned from the war by a recurring nightmare. And that recurring nightmare had all of his friends who had died in the war standing in a line in formation, much like this. Uh, it was a dream that haunted him basically until he died. He would wake up in a cold sweat, his wife would say. So this, this particular sequence really bears, and this is a story that Honda told uh, often, to, but only to his closest friends and family. So Kurosawa was certainly aware of it, and although Kurosawa has sole screenplay uh, credit on this film, it's, um, it, it's hard to imagine that Honda didn't have uh, a bit of influence over this segment. And this uh, photograph on the bottom is from um, the Crows sequence in which uh, Martin Scorsese, the great Martin Scorsese, plays Vincent van Gogh. And after his uh, segment was finished, after they wrapped shooting, uh, Scorsese took off his uh, wardrobe and makeup and ran over and asked if he could have his picture taken with Shiro Honda because he so admired him. And I'm happy and proud to say that Scorsese provides the foreword for our book. Now, just briefly, what is Honda's legacy? Well, the conversation around Honda and around Godzilla in particular has started to change over the last 15, 20 years. I would argue that the pivotal event was in 2004, the release by Rialto Pictures based here in New York 
and headed by our esteemed uh, moderator tonight, Bruce Goldstein, uh, that was the first wide release across the United States of Godzilla in its director's cut. Uh, before that, if you, 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 you know, you'd have to really have, to have your, your nose to the ground to find a copy of it on some sort of uh, black market video. Uh, a lot of people and a lot of film critics, a lot of film scholars didn't know that there was another version other than the Raymond Burr version. And the reviews uh, for this film when it was released here in that year, by the way, it was the 50th anniversary, which is perfect timing, uh, were revelatory. The New York Times uh, and many other publications saw the film in a whole new light and for the first time they were talking about Honda's direction and his contributions to it. Uh, more recently, we've seen things like um, the, uh, the 2011 release of Godzilla by the Criterion Collection, which is a uh, you know, a certification uh, of classic film status. Uh, we had the um, 2014 Legendary Pictures remake of Godzilla, which is of course the second big budget Hollywood remake of this film. Uh, and uh, though I have quibbles with some parts of the film, uh, they, the filmmakers do deserve credit for trying to take Godzilla and make it something relevant to things going on in the world today, much as Honda did back uh, in 1954. We have Shin Godzilla, uh, was one of the biggest films of Japan, in Japan two years ago. And uh, again, it, the politics of the film are much different than Honda's, but again, the film it tries to take Godzilla and, and reboot it in such a way that it's relevant to things happening in contemporary Japan and in the world, particularly the Fukushima disaster. And in 2020, this is a mock-up in the lower right, but I stole it from the internet because I liked it. Um, <laughs> There are no official posters, but a remake is in the works at Legendary of uh, Godzilla, uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, now called Godzilla versus Kong. Now, as for influence, there are many, many directors in Japan who cite Honda as an influence, and there are also many major uh, American filmmakers who, who credit him with inspiring them. Uh, Tim Burton, uh, Steven Spielberg, Guillermo del, Guillermo del Toro, and uh, many others. But I really like this quote from John Carpenter, uh, director of Escape from New York, Halloween, many other films. And uh, Carpenter provided this testimonial for our book. I first saw Godzilla in 1954 at the tender age of eight. Something about the film filled me with a somber dread. Not the giant fire breathing monster destroying Tokyo, but the overall tone. Uh, Japan is the only nation to suffer atomic bombs dropped on two of its cities and Godzilla gave powerful expression to the emotional ambience dis disguised as a giant monster movie. The director of this seminal motion picture was Ashiro Honda, one of my personal cinematic gods. Now Honda, as you can probably tell, uh, was uh, not an auteur but a, a popular cinema, a, a popular filmmaker, a populist filmmaker. He made his films not for himself, as many directors do, but he made them for the audience. And that relationship with the audience was something that he, he cherished. And I want to leave you with a quote uh, from Honda that I quite like, uh, summing up his work. And I think he was quite a realist about his own work. He knew about his own limitations, and he later in life would express regret that, for instance, he hadn't pushed back you know, and stood up for himself, so, so to speak. But uh, I, I quite like this quote. It is my regret that I couldn't make a film that I would consider the greatest of my life. However, it was definitely my pleasure that I was able to make something that people can remember. If I had not made Godzilla or the Mysterians, even if I would have received some kind of critical prize, it wouldn't be the same. There's nothing like the happiness I get from those things. When uh, my colleague Ed Gazuchewski and I set out to write this book, uh, around 10 years ago, by the way, uh, off and on, it, it took quite a, a, a series of, uh, it, it took quite a long time. Um, but the, the thing that we had in mind was to try to change the conversation around Ishiro Honda and to encourage people to look at him and his films uh, in a new light, to look at this man not just as a monster movie maker, but as a filmmaker. And uh, this event tonight is part of that conversation, and I really want to thank you for giving me the time. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Rialto, because, well, we've showed this at Film Forum, but right. it was releasing it through Rialto, why we got to know each other. Right. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know Bruce, uh, he's an incredible person, but um, I want to state that I don't know if I would be here tonight 
And I don't know if I would have had, or if Ed and I would have had the opportunity to write this book had it not been for the release of uh, Godzilla on the 50th anniversary. Which happened to have been the 50th anniversary because I was trying for 10 years to get the rights. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what made you want to, to direct that? Because, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I, to, re to I release I wish that. I had directed yeah, so. I, You'd be talking about me tonight. All right. Uh, how, I mean, you say it took 10 years or so, um, but obviously you had an interest in the film and you knew that it was something that needed to be reconsidered. Well, I first saw it right here at Japan Society in the early 80s. Does anybody remember a Kaiju Ega festival? You look yeah. old. Yeah. In the early 80s, right? 1979. Was it 79? Oh, I was four years old. Uh, yeah, I saw it. I was amazed by it. I've only seen the Raymond Burr version. And um, when I started Rialto in, what year did we start? Well, last year was the 20th, 97. That was one of the first films I wanted to go after. And I went, to, I was in Tokyo in 98. I go to Tok I was going to Tokyo a lot, married a Japanese woman. So I was in Tokyo. I decided to visit Toho. In those days, they had their old offices, which looked like Takashi Shimura's office in Akira, you know, with papers stuffed everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there was an old man, an old company man, must have been with the company for 50 years. He said, I'd like to get the rights to, to Godzilla. So he said, oh, OK. So he looks, and he's writing through the papers. He says, mm, you're going to have to go see a man named Mr. Henry Saperstein. Henry Stapperstein had been dead for about 30 years, right? No, 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 no. No? No, no. But he didn't have the rights in 97. Well, I don't know the timeline, but he, you know, he, he may have. He also produced Mr. Magoo, mm -hmm. and he owned the Harlem Glo Globetrotters. I don't know what the connection is. He also <laughs> merchandised Elvis Presley for a while, so he had his hand in a lot of... Uh, yeah, those Saperstein's, let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Hey, speaking of Toho, what's your, par your writing partner's last name? God's just, God's just Chesky. I, even after, I've known him for 20 and, years. And spell it. G well, the, the, here's the thing. Ed and I have known... <laughs> I can spell it, but, but the, the interesting thing is uh, Ed uh, has been at it a little longer than I have. And, um, He's the well, editor of Japanese Monsters. He, Japanese Giants magazine. Japanese Giants, But yeah. he wrote the cover story for the first issue of Fangoria magazine back in 1980-something. And it was a cover story about the history of Godzilla up to that point. And I, of course, bought it. And I brought it to school. I was in junior high, and I showed it to my friends. And everybody thought that his last name was a, a joke because the first five letters of his last name are the first five letters of Godzilla. So I, it, it took me a long time to understand that, no, it's his name. And, and now we've been friends for 20 plus years. We've worked on a lot of things together. And I still have trouble pronouncing I'm his name. I'm amazed Toho hasn't sued him for his name. Because yeah, right. They, you know, there you go. They did prevent you from using an image mm -hmm. and the name Godzilla on your excellent Godzilla biography. You called it Japan's Favorite, favorite monster, monster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Mr. The, what do you call it? Mr. G? Uh, the Big G, the which, big is, G, which, the big which G. was made up by the, the Monster Times magazine back in the day. Now, my original title, uh, I had just written, uh, while I was writing that book, I had just read uh, the Kitty Kelly uh, biography of Frank Sinatra, which is really trashy, but it's good fun. And I called uh, my book originally Godzilla, the unauthorized biography. <laughs> so, oh, that was, yeah. and, and, and they wouldn't let you. Well, it was originally going to be published by um, Random House here. And they had mocked up a, a great cover. And it had that title. And it was great. But uh, the, the issue wasn't the title. It was so much was the idea that uh, Godzilla's name was in the title. There was a whole series in the 1990s. Uh, the, the whole unauthorized guide to so-and-so was a big uh, thing in publishing because people were, were publishing, writing and publishing books about all kinds of films and TV shows without paying any rights to, to use those properties. And uh, there were a series of lawsuits, one about an X-Files book, one about a Jerry Seinfeld book. In any, in any case, it put the whole thing uh, to rest. And, oh, so uh, it wasn't just Toho. Well, Toho was, was uh, the problem in my case. Uh, yeah. They actually had sued another publisher, another writer, for $50 million and uh, had that book removed from circulation. So Random House saw that in the news and just um, they, they said, well, we're sorry, but we can't publish your book. Didn't they so. sue the producers of Bridezilla? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I want to, your new book, uh, the Honda bio yes. biography is so scrupulously researched Thank and you. detailed. Thank it's you. not an otaku book in no. any way. No. It's actually, um, there's nothing against otaku, but it's, it's really a social history of Japan right. before the war, during the war, right. and after the war through Honda's life. Right. And what amazed me is when you told me that you've seen all of 
virtually all of the extant, because there's some missing films, right. extant work of Honda. Yes. Some films we can't, some, even some of the uh, Kaiju Ega films we can't see in their proper version in this country, like we cannot see a proper King Kong versus right. Godzilla. Right. Unless or, you know somebody. And even in Japan, you can't see Half Human, right. which has been right. banned for political correctness reasons. Yeah, yeah. There were, the, for a long time, people had assumed that the film was, uh, they, the, the word banned was thrown around, and so it sounded like uh, there was some sort of uh, either uh, corporate or government, um, you know, uh, the, like the film was somehow sanctioned. or But it, it wasn't. It, it was a series of uh, things that happened starting in the 70s where uh, films, TV shows, books, and other pieces of content were basically withdrawn from, from circulation voluntarily by the entities that had originally put them out uh, for fear of uh, offending, you know, various interest groups. In this case, uh, Toho has never said anything about why Half Human is not available, but uh, there's a very strong uh, uh, group that represents the Barakumin, which is a, mm -hmm. a caste, a social caste it's in Japan. It's kind of like the Untouchables in India, I guess. Right, and, and this organization is kind of like the NAACP for the Barakumin, and uh, any time that, uh, that part of society is misrepresented, they feel, in, in content, they will go after those, those entities. And they'll, it's embarrassing, so uh, Toho has pulled that film uh, from circulation probably forever. But you know. they didn't censor the black-faced natives in Mothra. No, no. They're no. still well, there. Yeah. yeah, those aren't Japanese, so. Yeah. Oh, they're not. <laughs> not yeah. But it's almost impossible. We could see, at least in some form, dubbed or, or chopped up, mm -hmm. most of the horror and science fiction movies, but it's virtually impossible to see a subtitled version, at least, mm -hmm. of the non-monster in no. science fiction movies. No. And that's why doing a Honda retrospective is almost, we've tried it, yeah, but we it's can't. It's very difficult, yeah. yeah. No, and, and, and as part of uh, the work that we're doing to promote the book and get the word out, we've had a few uh, screening events, uh, one in Los Angeles, uh, one in Portland, uh, and we've, from the beginning, we were trying to get the Blue Pearl. Uh, I really thought that I could pair, if I could pair Godzilla with the Blue Pearl, it would be a nice evening of uh, Blue discussion. Blue Pearl also uh, re uh, kind of was a pioneer in underwater yes, it was. photography, right. which was used in Godzilla as right. well. I should have mentioned that. So there that, is a precedent there. there yeah, the, but also the film has a lot of uh, parallels to, to Godzilla, both thematically and in terms of um, the, the location the where Islanders, it was shot. It was yeah. shot in the same location where the Odo Island footage was shot for Godzilla. But there are other thematic uh, connections and it would make an interesting uh, compare and contrast. But no, we, we've got nowhere with that. It's impossible. But my hope is that, um, you know, there's a something, so things are always changing. Uh, the way films are, are distributed now and, um, and delivered is, has, is changing fast. We have Filmstruck, which has, uh, uh, all this uh, Criterion content. And um, one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years, first on Hulu, now through Filmstruck, a lot of films, Japanese films, that I never thought would see the light of day in this country are starting to pop up. Because they can bypass the avenue of physical uh, media, uh, it's cheaper, I guess. And, and so there have been a number of Toho... See, we always tended to get in this country, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, I mean, historically, we, we would get the films, foreign films that won awards sure. in, in film festivals we, we around the world. We don't see the little films, the, the films for the that's mass what, the, 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 the mass, mass audience public. films. That's what I'm getting at. We don't see, and Japan. It's true of every country though. Right, French, exactly. French, Italian. That's what I'm getting at. So yeah. there's this rich commercial cinema in Japan, and that's what Honda was really part of. Honda's films are really the, the, the exception and, and that those were available here. But I've started to see, we've started to see uh, through Filmstruck and, and previously Hulu, a number of, of these commercial genre pictures or, or entertainment pictures popping up, uh, things I thought I'd never see. There are uh, some spy pictures starring Akira Takarada uh, as Andrew Hoshino. Uh, one is called, uh, well, the titles they're playing under or were playing under are 100 shot, 100 killed, and the other one is uh, golden eyes. They're kind of like James Bond spoof. They're great well, fun. One became What's Up Tiger Lily. Right, that's a similar kind of thing, yeah. but uh, that, that's a whole other story. But what I'm hoping is that, that, that uh, an avenue will uh, appear for Honda's films to be distributed this but way. But you've managed to see everything. Yes, but we uh, have connections. But you don't speak Japanese. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the great uh, uh, advantages we had in, in writing this book the whole book came together. The idea for it actually happened when Ed and I were in uh, Japan in 2007 uh, producing a documentary film called Bringing Godzilla Down to Size. 
which was uh, released uh, as an add-on on, on a, a, a DVD that came out here with Rodan and War of the Gargantuas. But um, we, by pure happenstance, happened to meet Honda's son, Ryuji, uh, while we were interviewing someone else in an office. And we hit it off with him right away, and he saw that we were such uh, huge admirers of his father and his father's work. And it, it came up that he was, he would, he, it was actually kind of his suggestion that we consider writing a biography of his dad. Now, what that biography would look like, that, that, that idea evolved over time. But that was the, uh, the, the, the first, um, that, that's how we got started. And, and Ryuji opened doors for us, and he also introduced us to his daughter, Honda's granddaughter, Yuko. And she uh, ended up becoming, she's credited on the front of the book because even though she didn't write the manuscript, she was what you'd call a full partner in the project, a thought partner. I mean, she engaged in the, we had discussions about this. Facilitator. Yeah, well, but, but, but she also, she grew up in her grandfather's house. She knew her grandfather. And uh, so, and she had a keen uh, interest in making sure he was represented properly, but more than anything, she wanted to learn about him. And she helped us track down these films. We had a research assistant, associate uh, in Japan, who helped track down these films. Because a lot of them, even though they're not commercially available on video, a lot of them have uh, played on cable television there, and people tape them. And so he knew people, and he knew how to find people. And eventually, we uh, were able to get our hands on all the films, except for Night School, which is a film Honda made independently uh, with a student crew. But it was and it was released not through Toho, but Daiye. Uh, in the late 50s, and that, uh, ironically, uh, it came out on DVD just as the book oh, was I coming see. out. Oh, which one is lost? Uh, there's one film, that, the one film that's lost, it's called, well, it has multiple titles, but it's usually known as Story of a Co-op. It's a, a documentary that he made uh, about the co-op movement in, uh, during the occupation. He made documentaries yes. early in his career. And, yes. uh, Blue Pearl has a documentary feel. Yes. And after the war, the first job he got, he was in the service for how many years? Ten years. Off Drafted line. three times, as you said. Yes. He, he, he actually, it held back his career, what he could have been doing in the meantime. Meanwhile, Kurosawa was shooting up oh, the sure. corporate ladder. He gets back from the war, and Kurosawa is already a director. Right. What was his first job, Honda? Well, Honda, uh, well, to backtrack just a little bit, uh, one of the things in the, the book that's sort of heartbreaking uh, and, and also kind of uh, gives you an understanding of the relationship between these two men. You know, they became best friends at Toho. They were roommates. They uh, were called the Three Crows. The, uh, the three gentlemen, Honda, Kurosawa, and Taniguchi, were like the three musketeers, the three, the three crows on the lot. They were uh, considered like a part of the best and the brightest. Uh, but uh, there's a story related in the book where Honda's off at the front, and he would exchange letters both with his wife and with Kurosawa, and, and Kurosawa writes the letter to tell Honda that I'm about to direct my first film. And keep in mind that Kurosawa entered the studio after Honda did, so, but Kurosawa did not serve in the war. Uh, a lot of filmmakers actually served in the war, but Honda's career was pushed back or held back more than many of the other ones because he served repeatedly and, and at such length. Um, so after uh, the war, when Honda re-enters the studio, as we talked about, it was you know very much a struggle to get work. Uh, but some of the er one of one of the turning points in that time period was a film called Stray Dog, uh, which Kurosawa directed in 1949, I want to say. 49. But uh, at that point, because the studio system was uh, sort of on the rocks, um, Kurosawa was a, among this group of filmmakers that left Toho and formed a, an independent production company called the Film Art Association that uh, briefly produced a series of, of pretty good films, and one of them being Stray Dog. And Honda uh, was an assistant director for his best friend, but uh, Kurosawa trusted Honda so much more than your average assistant director that he actually, this was the start of Honda actually shooting segments for Kurosawa films, uh, the black market sequence. Which the is film. the best yeah. part of the movie. I agree. It's, it's the it's, very beginning. It's yeah. very close to the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. It's kind of a documentary look at the black market, I guess around Ueno Station. Right. And, and, and it's, state, it, right after the war. It's amazing. Right, actually. it is. And, and, uh, and it's related in the book, but uh, in the film, it's Mifune walking around the black market undercover as a repatriated soldier with right. the, the uniform on. But that's he's actually... looking for his gun, right? Right. He's, yeah. that's the whole story is about the, the gun being pickpocketed, and he's trying to get it back. But um, that is actually Ishiro Honda being shot from behind as he's body doubling right. for, for Mifune. Yeah. And so he, he actually, his career mm -hmm. as a 
as a full-fledged director was really less than 30 years. Right. From 51 to 75. Right. It's really 24 years. No. Well, it's even less than that, really, yeah. because he retired in around 70. So and it's then he less than 20 he years. came back and directed one more film. That's right. And that's really, it was cut short by, by the changes in the, in the business. Um, you know, the, the 60s was a time of great change in Japan. It was the, uh, the year of the rapid economic development, the, the, the economic miracle that Japan experienced in the 60s, largely uh, due to all the development around the Olympics. Um, but as everybody bought TVs to watch the Olympics on television, they started to go to the movies less and less. And that's one of the things that uh, compelled Toho to make uh, these films into more family-friendly films rather than straight-ahead science fiction and to make them more kid-oriented. They were trying to keep the kids in the seats. He made these special kiddie show versions of right, the monster right, movies. Right, right. He re-edited some of the early right. ones into like 50-minute programs. Right. For, for there was a whole series of uh, matinee programs that would run uh, during the times of the year when uh, the kids were out of school. Uh, it was actually influenced by Toei Studios, had an animation festival that they used to do. And uh, Toho had what was called the Champion Festival, and they would take one of these Kaiju Ega movies, either a new one or, um, uh, or the, oftentimes in the 70s, they would take some of the older ones and cut them down to about an hour. And Honda decided that, I mean, he, he didn't really like this at all, but he said, well, if someone's going to do this, then I might as well do it. You know? He liked to, to, he wanted to at least have that ability to, to supervise it. But yeah, it was the, the things that changed his career were the changes in the business. It, and, and, and they were largely forces beyond his control. Yeah. Uh, you, we mentioned that, you mentioned that he was a company man. He mm -hmm. really was. He did things that the front office order he really didn't like. And one of the things he, he didn't like them anthropomorphizing Godzilla right. and making him cute. He especially didn't like him doing the high sign. Right. What, what do you call that? The high sign. Which no, one but is? It, there's a Japanese word that you use in the, it's not a mie, but something like that. Mm. Godzilla going, Oh, the shie. Yes, the shie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the picture. It's kind of like a yes, yeah, yeah. you know, after a battle. <laughs> it's the victory dance. Yeah, the yeah. victory yeah, dance, yeah. yeah. And dancing in the uh, Astro Monster. Right, right. There he you. did it because he, he was, a company guy. Right. Well, to be fair, I mean, uh, Toho had a lot of company men. And I mean, Kurosawa started off as a, a, a studio. Yeah, employee. but he didn't like it. And well, he didn't like it. But, you know, and Honda, to be fair, he eventually left. I mean, he, he put up with it a lot longer than, than he might have wanted to. But he did eventually leave because he could no longer make the films the way he wanted to make them. One thing, uh, you know, it's also worth mentioning that there were periods when uh, it's not as if he just took everything the studio gave and, and, and just did what he was told. He rejected lots of projects. There was a, uh, two periods in the early 60s where for uh, about a year at a time he didn't work. And uh, part of it was he was retrenching. He, he knew that you know, he had been very successful. He made the, the studio a lot of money and he was starting to get uncomfortable with these types of pictures. So he took some time off and put together a bunch of uh, projects that he tried to pitch to the studio, but because uh, the, the climate was changing, and the types of films that he wanted to make were no longer really on the table as, as often. Uh, his projects weren't accepted. Some of them were, they were put into production, and then they were canceled. But uh, those were, there was this whole series of things that sort of disillusioned him. And yet what I love about his story is that it has a happy ending, because he's reunited with Kurosawa. And for those roughly 13 years, they made films on their own terms. Best friends making it's films the way they wanted to make them. It's hard to believe it was 13 years. Yeah. It's almost the length of his whole career. Yeah. He, he made Terror of Mecha Godzilla, mm -hmm. retires, and it, he has a great second act with his old buddy, right. Kurosawa. He didn't, never thought that was a demotion going back to square one. No, because as I said, uh, and people uh, would ask them about their relationship, their professional relations, and Honda would get frustrated because uh, he would get phone calls from journalists asking, like, how can the director of Godzilla be working as an assistant director for Kurosawa? And, uh, you know, he had no interest in explaining it. You know, it, for him, it was just this, this relationship of mutual trust. He would do anything that Kurosawa asked. But yet, think about it this way. This is the way I like to explain it. What other director? The Kurosawa is one of the most uh, respected, revered directors on the planet. And here he is asking another director who's renowned in his own right to work at his side. That takes, and Kurosawa had an incredible ego, but that takes an incredible, I don't know, uh, 
tr amount of trust to, to even ask that question. Conversely, Conda is somebody who is a director in his own right who has to have a, an incredible amount of respect and trust to accept that role. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And there's no other partnership, I think, like it in, in the history of cinema, at least that I know of. So the first film was Ron. Kagamusha. Kagamusha's first, mm -hmm. and then Ron. Yes. Which, by the way, is another Rialto picture release. I just want you to know that. <laughs> so we have two Honda films, sort of. Uh, what were the others? Uh, Dreams. Dreams, uh, Rhapsody in Rhapsody August, and, August. and Mata Dayo, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the Raymond Burr version. Okay. The controversial. That's how you got to love these films, from yeah. these bad versions. Right. Actually, the Raymond Burr version is not a bad version. We love this version. It's just an entirely different movie. Right. right. Is that how you see it? Uh, yes, I suppose so. Uh, I look at it as like a, you know, a blessing and a curse or a necessary evil. Uh, you know, because I, I'm conscious of the fact that, I mean, I, that was, like, like you said, it's the only version that I knew growing up. That's how I knew Godzilla. By the way, John Carpenter, the things he was saying, he couldn't possibly have seen in Godzilla, King of the Monsters, because the whole metaphor is, is cut out. Uh, it, no, it's not. Well, metaphor maybe, but the, the subject matter isn't entirely cut but out. But some of the best bits are cut out right. of the, the, like the scene in the subway. Right. It's kind of black humor about the bomb, if you can imagine that. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the lady senator who's seen in Godzilla, King of the Monsters, right. but you don't hear what she's saying, which right. is right. amazing. All those great things in that. And the commentator on Tokyo Tower, I think, is right. cut out. Well, some of the best, they cut some of the best stuff. Yeah. But I still love it. Well, you know, again, necessary evil. And it was, in, you know, we wouldn't be here now if not for that. Uh, so it, it opened the door. I mean, people often say that Rashomon uh, introduced Japanese cinema to the West and Godzilla, and particularly Godzilla, King of the Monsters, introduced Japanese popular culture to the West. It was kind of the forerunner of anime and Tamagotchi, <laughs> everything that has come since. Did you know Rashomon was released by RKO in this country? Uh, yes, I've read that. It did. I, I wonder what kind of... But I don't know. But I, don't, I would like to see where it was shown. Mm -hmm. Was it only art houses? I don't know. Yeah. Well, we're getting the, the oh, sign getting to wrap the, it up. Oh, okay. I just wanted to ask sure. you about the Japanese uh, release of Godzilla, King of the Monsters in 1959. Mm -hmm. the, the reverse release? The reverse release. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, this I think it had something to do with the fact that Raymond Burr was suddenly a big TV star in Japan, so they wanted to exploit that right. aspect. The American of television, uh, a lot of TV shows were imported uh, to Japan in the late 50s because as television was starting to... Uh, more and more people were starting to acquire TVs, but there really wasn't a lot of uh, domestic content yet. So, um, but I think uh, one of the things that, that's most funny about that release, Godzilla King of the Monsters was brought back to Japan uh, in the late 50s. Dubbed with Japanese side titles. Dubbed it's unbelievable. And, and, and cropped for, for Toho Scope. Right. Well, what's, so, yeah. what's kind of hilarious about it is that uh, in the film, so many things, so, uh, the meaning of so many scenes has changed where the original Japanese dialogue may still exist. You can hear someone talking, but Raymond Burr and his translator are off to the side telling you what they're saying, but it's, it's something completely different because they're changing, <laughs> changing the meaning for the American storyline. So they, then it goes back to Japan. They're oblivious to the dialogue, the cutting of the, the King of the Monsters. They right. don't know what they're saying. Right. Well, they're putting scenes exactly. out of order. So, so when it comes back to Japan, yeah. you've got, you can, now the people in the audience can hear the Japanese dialogue, but they've probably got translation or a side titles telling you what Raymond Burr thinks they're saying, and it's completely different. I <laughs> can only imagine what that must have been like. Anyway, well, it's part of the uh, illustrious uh, history of this genre. Yeah. Well, you should all go buy the book. That's Thank all I can say. It's a great book, and you're fantastic. Oh. I, you, everything I wanted to ask you, you said already. Oh, but, well. But you're great. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.